Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Shobana Balakrishnan and I'm here today to introduce and welcome Frank Wilczek, winner of the 2004 Nobel Prize in Physics, visiting us as part of the MSR Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Frank Wilczek is discussing with us his new book, The Lightness of Being, Mass, Ether, and the Unification of Forces. Which, pro which provides an accessible review of the structure of physical reality, the nature of space, the contents of the universe, and the future of human in inquiry. Frank Wilczek won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2004 for work that he did as a 21-year-old graduate student. His 1989 book, Longing for the Harmonies, was a New York Times notable book of the year a regular contributor to Nature and Physics Today. Wilczek's work has been anthologized in Best American Science Writing and the Norton, An Norton Anthology of Light Verse. He lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he's currently the Herman Feshbach Professor of Physics at MIT. So please join me in welcoming Frank Wilczek to Microsoft Research. Hi. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming on this beautiful day. Uh, I've used a lot of Microsoft products. <laughs> it's nice to be here. It is an Apple computer. <laughs> That's all right, I'm told. <laughs> um, so I'd like to take you on the next half hour away from familiar shores and on a little adventure well, a great adventure, actually, uh, to, sh to find new aspects of uh, reality. The title of this little talk... Should ...is Anticipating a New Golden Age. In the 20th century, fundamental physics advanced uh, dramatically, but most dramatically, I would say, in three sort of discrete, brief, golden ages. One, around 1910, when the theories of relativity uh, were developed, the special and general theory of relativity. Another, around 1925, when quantum mechanics uh, took form. And then a third, uh, around 1970, when what's now called often the standard model to make it sound boring, but what I call the core theory was developed, which is a profound theory of how matter behaves, not only how it behaves, but why it is what it is, uh, that's proved to be extraordinarily accurate and precise, as well as complete, as in subsequent years it's been tested rigorously by physicists, experimenters, trying to poke holes in it and get Nobel Prizes for themselves by uh, finding essentially new phenomena. But uh, the core theory has held up extremely well to this probing and prodding. And so far, all those efforts to uh, drag it down have only made it look better and better. However, we're not satisfied because the equations of that core theory are not as pretty as they should be for a theory that's so fundamental. And conceptually, it leaves us with four distinct forces, the strong electromagnetic uh, weak and gravitational forces that appear to be independent. We'd like to have a unified theory of nature in which they weren't four independent fundamental forces. And also uh, there are different kinds of matter, uh, technically fermions and bosons, typified if you like by 
light, photons, and matter, electrons, that, uh, again, appear to be very different. We'd like to have a description of the world in which there's only one thing. And the message is that uh, we might be almost there. And that's why I anticipate that there's a new golden age. We have promising ideas for making these unifications. We've had promising ideas now uh, for a while. The germs of these ideas were already uh, present in the 1980s. But it, what's new is that now, just now, we're going to have the tool that uh, seems to be adequate to see whether these ideas are, in fact, on the right track or not. This is what's called the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC. So in the next few minutes, I'd like to give you a brief tour of this tool, a visual tour, mostly. So if you are in an airplane and flying over Geneva and look down, this is what you see, a kind of mystic scene on a beautiful day like this with mountains in the background and mists appropriate to a mystic scene. This is Lake Geneva, the city of Geneva over here. And then you see something really peculiar. You see this big red circle on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> That's the LHC. Well, I'm kidding, of course. You don't actually see a red circle on the ground. In fact, uh, what you see on the ground from this project is practically nothing, but that circle is the projection upwards of what's actually there. This 27 kilometer long ring underground, or about 18 miles, uh, that's the LHC project. What's above ground is a f uh, not very notable at all, a few uh, little buildings uh, spread over 27. Um, over this uh, radius. And what will happen there, oh, first of all, this is, this is what's inside the, the, that ring. These are, this, you have to imagine this going on for 27 kilometers or 18 miles. These are Powerful superconducting magnets, similar to the ones you might find in a hospital if you're getting an MRI uh, scan, but s somewhat more powerful. These. And uh, they're superconducting, so they have to be held at liquid helium temperatures. That's what all this stuff is, to keep the liquid helium flowing, to keep them within three, to three degrees of absolute zero so that they can function properly. This project, I think, in its scale and in its devotion to a kind of abstract goal, ideal, is our civilization's answer to the pyramids of Egypt. But much better because it's really inspired by curiosity as opposed to superstition. It's constructed by cooperation rather than uh, command. And its size is not just vanity, size for the sake of size. Its size is determined by uh, what its function is. Oops. So what's going to happen there is that protons will be guided by those magnets in circular paths and accelerated so that their speeds are within one part in a billion, no, a million, I'm sorry, one part in a million of the speed of light, which is the limiting speed. Protons moving that fast have enormous energy. Uh, you'll have beams moving in opposite directions, going around the beam, going around the ring, and at a few points, the beams will cross. Their uh, collisions will occur, and densities of energy that were last seen uh, 
when the universe was a hundred thousandth of a second old, close to the Big Bang, will be reproduced again. And extremes of energy density that uh, have never been probed before in a controlled laboratory setting will be created. To monitor what happens, uh, people have built extraordinary detectors that you see here. Uh, here are the people, to give you a sense of the scale of the thing. So it's, it's uh, like a cubicle, ten-story building, 30 meters on a side. Uh, dense with electronics, fastest state-of-the-art electronics. Out of this will flow 15 petabytes of information per year, storing the results of collisions that look like this. That's equivalent to half a million telephone conversations going on all the time that have to be analyzed. So it's a job uh, worthy of the NSA, the National <laughs> Security Agency. But uh, the information is, is encoded in much more obscure ways in the details of these particles. Well, you can also see here. <laughs> these are what the, collision, the results of the collisions look like. What you see is, in practice, you see uh, as if this little bang, this recreation of the Big Bang in a very small volume for a very short time, uh, leaves debris and we'll try to reconstruct the basic processes that caused it. Uh, and the difficulty of that is similar to trying to reconstruct what a mountain looked like by studying the result of an avalanche. We try to, but that's, that's, that's what these computers are going to do. The information will be fed to a new kind of computer architecture called the grid to deal with this gush of information, to analyze it. Uh, our core theory, we believe, is so good that almost everything that occurs at this accelerator uh, will be described by it. But one in a trillion or so of the events will have something fundamentally new. So we've got to find those events, which to the eye don't look very different from routine events. Uh, and the computers hierarchically try to figure out what's going on, uh, find the needle in a haystack that's a fundamentally new physics, and at the end of the day, finally, a human being looks at it and uh, tries to interpret what's going on. So, that's a discussion of sort of what it is at a very nitty-gritty level, this answer of ours to the pyramids of Egypt as a, as, an, as a physical object. But what is it for? What is it really, what is its uh, purpose? It's actually very simple and in a grand tradition of science. It's in a direct line of descent from Leeuwenhoek studying with uh, optic, optical light, ordinary light, uh, through his microscopes, uh, with magnification and discovering cells inside uh, living things, or Rosalind Franklin using x-rays and diffraction patterns and some sophisticated uh, inf uh, image processing done by Crick and Watson to figure out the structure of DNA. What this thing is, what this LHC is, is an ultra-stroboscopic nanomicroscope. We want to see with it distances much smaller than you can access with visible light or even x-rays. It's, even at a technical level, it's a nanomicroscope. That is, it, uh, it's looking at things that are nanomicrometers in size, that kind of scale. 
And the action there is very, very rapid, so that it also has to have very good resolution in time. Now, to give you a sense of the sort of strange things that you uh, can expect to see there, I'd like to show you a picture now of the deep structure of reality that we do understand at slightly larger scales than the LHC is going to probe. Now, our eyes were not evolved, or maybe designed, no, evolved, to, uh, <laughs> to, to resolve distances of the order of 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, or times of order 10 to the minus 24th seconds, the sort of time scales and distance scales involved in uh, the structure of atomic nuclei or inside protons. But uh, using the, the, resolving those kinds of distances and times wouldn't have been of use in avoiding predators or finding new mates, finding desirable mates, uh, the things that we were evolved for. However, now using our noodles and the careful study of science and uh, taking our equations that we can check in other ways seriously to reconstruct what our eyes would see if they had that kind of resolution in space and time, we can make an image. So I'm now going to show you a video of the deep structure of reality. This is what your <coughs> eyes would see if they were capable of resolving 10 to the minus 13 centimeters and 10 to the minus 24th seconds. So if we can dim the lights a little, uh, yeah, I guess I can even myself. Uh, here it comes, brace yourself, the deep structure of reality. It looks like a lava lamp. <laughs> this is computed, this is not some artist's impression, this is a computer with very elaborate calculations. Uh, a computed picture of fluctuations in the energy in gluon fields that are happening all the time and everywhere according to our core theories which we can check in many many uh, ways. So now you've seen it. <clears throat> and the purpose of the LHC is to let us resolve even smaller things. So things that are blurry in this picture will come into focus uh, with the LHC. Yes? So what is the by the uh, it's just the density of energy. So the, the interior ones with the more spectacular colors have the higher energy density. Right. It's a basic features, feature of our uh, deepest theories of physics now, quantum field theories they're called, that for everything that exists as a particle or an element of reality, uh, as a real thing, it also exists as a fluctuation in empty space, as a kind of so-called virtual particle that comes to be and passes away uh, spontaneously all the time. And what you were seeing there was basically virtual gluons, the, whole, the stuff that holds our quarks together and makes protons and neutrons, and is responsible for most of your mass. Uh, that, that, those were the, the fluctuations in the gluon fields, but electron fields fluctuate, so you have spontaneous production of electrons and positrons, which come to be for a very short time, then annihilate each other, pass away, and so on for everything that exists. So that the LHC, by taking pictures of empty space, now experimentally, will be sampling these fluctuations and therefore taking a sample of everything that exists. So empty space has it all, but in the quantum world, to see something, we've learned, uh, you have to disturb it, you have to interact with it in a minimal way. This was the conceptual revolution introduced by quantum theory. We came to see that 
Uh, you can't make observations with arbitrary precision without disturbing things. And in the deep quantum world, which we're concerned with here, so way, way subatomic, where quantum effects are dominant, ah, <laughs> you go one step further to see these things, to make the virtual particles real, in a sense you have to create them. Or making that a little less mystical and more concrete, if you want to produce a particle of mass m, a particle whose fluctuations uh, are very small in space and limited in time, then you must supply at least, to make it leap out from the virtual world into the real world, you have to uh, supply at least a minimum energy E which that particle can possibly have because since energy is conserved, you better supply the energy that's there at the end uh, to start with. So, uh, so to produce a particle of mass m, to produce a heavy particle, which corresponds to the very fine structure of uh, space, you have to supply at least the minimum energy that that particle has, which is what it has if it's at rest, namely the, the Einstein's famous m times c squared. <clears throat> and that's why uh, LHC is meant to concentrate enormous amounts of energy and why there's a premium on producing enorm collisions that have enormous amounts of energy so that we can make heavier particles and so we can probe shorter distances and times. Now, oh, sorry. <laughs> so now I've given you uh, the scientific background. Uh, before the quiz, I think it's only fair to give a review. So now uh, I'm going to give a review in, I hope, user-friendly video form. This will be a different perspective on the physics I just told you about. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm about to drop some particle physics in the club. So we're dropping particle physics in the club. To LHC is super duper fly. You know what I'm saying. Check it. Underground, designed with mind, with sense, photons around right. a circle that passes through Switzerland and France. Sixty nations contribute to scientific advance. Two pairs of protons swing round through the ring they ride, till in the hearts of the detectors that made to collide and all the energy. So these are real people, tiny, really at CERN, and, and most of it is quite accurate.
Actually, this video goes wrong at that point, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> but I hope you found that entertaining as a review. <laughs> and now I'd like to discuss uh, what I hope and expect uh, will be the big, the most profound uh, scientific development to come out of this. So my vision. Oops. I mentioned that we have a core theory that's extremely accurate, very complete as a description of normal matter, and very precise and in its way mathematically elegant, but it still has flaws. In particular, it postulates the existence of four fundamental forces that are separate. Uh, the, tr the traditional forces of physics that have been known for hundreds of years, gravity and the electromagnetic forces, and two that were only disco discovered in the 20th century when we carefully studied subnuclear physics that are called uh, the strong and weak force, not very imaginatively. <laughs> now, let me, I'll leave gravity aside for the moment. The other three forces are described by equations that kind of have, that have a, a family resemblance. There, some of you probably know that in electromagnetism we have Maxwell's equations, which are the, the classic equations of electromagnetism. The equations we use today in the core theory for the weak and strong interactions are kind of like Maxwell's equations on steroids. They have not one kind of charge, which is electric charge, uh, in the electromagnetic interactions, but several kinds of charges that are called colors or weak charges in the, in the, in the different cases. But they really have very similar properties to electric charge. And so we have this very suggestive situation where at least three of the four fundamental forces seem to be described in very similar terms with elegant equations based on symmetry. We would like to think, it seems that nature is begging us to try to see all these different forces as aspects of one underlying uh, unifying structure, like different sides of a die with all the charges being different sides of the same die. And when you try to implement that idea, you're, you very quickly find some striking successes. Things you didn't understand before uh, suddenly make sense in that context. I told you the equations of the core theory are somewhat lopsided. If you embed them in a larger structure that makes symmetry between uh, the different kinds of charges, then you learn that they're lopsided in just the way they had to be in order for them all to fit on the same die, roughly speaking. So. So, uh, or another way of putting it is if they weren't lopsided in exactly the way they are, but a different way, it wouldn't work. So that's understanding why they're lopsided in the particular way they are. So a lot of things work, you explain more things. You explain more that you didn't understand before. However, one thing doesn't work. Uh, if there's going to be a way of seeing all these different interactions on the same footing, putting them into a unified field theory, they have to have the same basic power. But when we go out and observe, 
we find that they don't have the same basic power. The strong interaction really is stronger, even at the shortest distances we've measured, uh, than the other interactions. So if we put strength of interaction this way, it's on the bottom, and then the other interactions are like that. However, now we remember, oh, I'm sorry, and another problem with the standard model as a final theory of nature is that we're left with different kinds of matter. We would like to think there's not, not only just one underlying interaction, but also one kind of matter. Uh, but in the, th in the theory, uh, there are four different kinds of matter. I'm simplifying a bit. Where it says electrons, it should say elect leptons, for instance, but never mind. Uh, but basically, there are four distinctly different kinds of matter, uh, electrons and quarks, photons, and gluons that are the building blocks of normal matter. And four is a pretty small number, but one is even smaller. We'd like to get to complete unity. Oh, so now our vision of unity almost works, but we have to but it doesn't. So we could give up, but rather than giving up, we remember that what we see isn't necessarily what there is. We don't see right down to the shortest distances where presumably the simplest, most basic properties are revealed. We see through this distorting medium of fluctuations. And so if we're going to really see what's basically there at the shortest distances, it gets, gets it all started, uh, we have to strip away the distortions introduced by this medium we're embedded in. And although it's very difficult to do that experimentally, I showed you how to uh, get to shorter distances you, by a factor of 10, you have to build the LHC. Uh, if we want to get many orders of magnitude, which is what's required here, uh, we'd have to build an, a super LHC that circled the Earth, or maybe one that circled, was, uh, filled the orbit of Pluto, or something like that. And that's not going to happen anytime soon. But using our noodles, we can calculate what happens. And when we do that, when we make this correction, we find a wonderful result. I was going to say surprise. It certainly was a surprise when I first found it, but now it's a result, that is that, lo and behold, when we do the corrections, strip away those distortions, they do come together. And so the differences between electrons and quarks, which followed from the fact that they have different strong and weak electromagnetic and weak interactions fall away if the, those interactions all are seen as part of an underlying unity. So that's unified. And these guys get unified, too. However, there was an asterisk, which now I'm going to own up to. The asterisk is that in doing this calculation of the distortion, I had to include all the fluctuations that exist. And when I did that, using just the particles we know about, it didn't quite work. It does work, however, if we up the ante a little bit, expand our equations in another direction, We didn't have complete unity. <laughs> Sorry. We didn't have complete unity before because the different kinds of matter still fell into two bits. There's room for expanding the equations further to making complete unity among different kinds of matter. This to a physicist at first seems completely outrageous because electrons and photons are such different, different kinds of particles. How could they be 
seen as different aspects of the same underlying reality, electrons uh, repel each other by what's called the Pauli exclusion principle. They refuse to do the same thing in quantum mechanics. Whereas photons love to do the same thing, that's why they organize themselves into laser beams and so forth. So they're, they're as different as can be. These are called fermions and bosons. But there is a way, called supersymmetry, of embedding them in a set of equations where they appear on the same footing and symmetrically. That requires expanding the equations of physics, adding new stuff. When we add new stuff, that new stuff appears as virtual particles and contributes to the correction. And so when I did the calculation of the correction that actually worked, that was including the extra stuff you needed to get supersymmetry. So by upping the ante to get unification in both directions, uh, it finally works. And as a bonus, well, it works, but uh, the particles had better show up at the LHC. <laughs> and as a bonus, I left gravity to the side. Now I'm going to bring it back. Gravity, as a force between elementary particles, is ridiculously weaker than the other forces. You see here, the strong force is about 10 times stronger than the electric force, for instance. If I compare, tried to put gravity on the same footing, it would not be just 10 times weaker, or not 10 times 10, imagine going up, or 10 times 10 times 10. You would have to multiply by 10 41 times until you got to gravity. That would take you way, way, way outside the known universe. So gravity is ridiculously weaker, technically by a factor of 10 to the 41, than uh, the other forces. It wouldn't fit here. It would go way, way outside the known universe. However, gravity responds directly to energy, and so its effective strength is not just modified by these fluctuations in empty space, but also just by the fact that at short distance you ha says you have larger energies in the fluctuations. And gravity is also has to be modified. It's, the measure of its strength is also modified as you go to short distances or large energies. You can do the calculation to compare. I've done it. So here it comes. Gravity, from being way, way outside the known universe, at the last minute comes and unifies pretty much with the other ones too. So it's a really tantalizing vision, I think, <coughs> of upping the ante for unification in uh, two very different senses, and then everything really clicks together. So nature is singing a siren song. Is she teaching or teasing? I don't know. But here I am, having listened to the siren song, <laughs> finally getting to confront <laughs> nature. <laughs> and there's going to be, at the LHC, a trial by fire. Because those particles that we needed to make it all work, these particles associated with supersymmetry, will either show up or not. And if they don't show up, the trial by fire <laughs> will annihilate the whole thing. The ideas will go up in smoke. But on the other hand, maybe this will happen. You analyze these events. Oh, and there's a supersymmetric particle. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another one. So. We're going to find out. 
uh, before very long, the time scale is maybe one year, maybe five years, whether these tantalizing visions of unification and a new golden age of physics uh, correspond to reality or not. <laughs> so, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> and we can, we can take, I'll take some questions now. My experience is, oh, I see my experience is irrelevant, but anyway, I want to make the joke. My experience is <laughs> that, that often there's an, oh, actually, it's an exciting time to be a physicist, but you don't have to be a physicist to appreciate that it's an exciting time, that the world can, is going to be enriched by looking at shorter distances and shorter times and seeing what's there. Maybe we'll get these visions of, real, of uh, symmetry and unity fulfilled. Maybe something else dramatic will happen. Maybe we'll find out what the dark matter is. You don't have to be a physicist to appreciate it. It's really an exciting time to be a thinking being. Okay, so to forego awkward <laughs> silences, <laughs> here are some suggested questions. But I'll take the questions. <laughs> I'll take the questions that actually arise. Yeah. Theoretical bounds and the masses of associated particles, which is to say, how sure are you that you don't see them? The theory is wrong. Uh, they're not as tight as we'd like. But if nothing shows up at the LHC, uh, supersymmetry won't be able to do this job of unification. So at least a few of them have to show up at the LHC, I believe. Yeah. And yeah. So. If, uh, you do find the particles yes. in the LHC that you're looking for. Will theoretical physics be over? Mm. <laughs> no, because uh, although this calculation, and this re actually relates to the previous question too, the, the, the evidence that I've shown you, such as it is, or indirect evidence for the existence of these particles, is based on how they correct how the couplings come together. Uh, that effect takes place over such a range of energy, and so gradually, if you like, that uh, it doesn't matter so much if, if it starts a factor of two in energy l sooner or later. So we don't have real detailed control on the masses of these particles. And there's no consensus, no real understanding of, even if supersymmetry is correct, uh, which of the many new particles are involved will be heavier than other ones. And that, inf those facts encode information about fundamental physics that's very profound and may also uh, cough up the dark matter for us if, if the lightest particle has the right properties, lightest supersymmetric particle has the right properties. So I focused on one particular question of physics, of achieving unification, uh, at a sort of crude level of just the powers being equal. Uh, and that would be, no question, a major advance, I think, worthy of comparison with the other golden ages of relativity or quantum mechanics or getting the core theory. Uh, but it wouldn't be the end because there would still be many, many open questions left, including what is the dark matter? How does supersymmetry get broken, it's not a perfect symmetry. Uh, why are, are there repetitions among the families of different particles? Other ones that, well, I could easily give another lecture on. Uh, so so this, this would solve problems, but open up even more ambitious problems, allow us to penetrate closer to the Big Bang, but not explain why the Big Bang happened, for instance. So we'd make progress, but it wouldn't be the end. We, we'd find we, there, are, there are open questions, and wholly new questions would open up, too. Yeah? Um, uh, string theory, is it truly falsifiable? Is string theory falsifiable? Uh, well, not in its present form. The, the people have not um, been able to solve the equations of string theory with sufficient precision and specificity to make uh, definite prediction, so it's all kind of vague. These ideas I've been discussing uh, are kind of independent of string theory. They're not, they don't contradict string theory, but neither have they been derived from string theory. They're more sort of 
just uh, taking the empirical facts and trying to organize the patterns so that we can make another step, another big step. <laughs> but so, but it's, it's sort of driven by the data as opposed to driven by highly mathematical uh, idealizations. Yeah? Uh, one trillionth of 15 te uh, petabytes is only f uh, one ki kilobyte a month. How long before we get even one good picture of the rare events you're talking about? What? No. There are 15 te uh, petabytes a year, and only one trillionth of the data is, uh, has new stuff. So that's about a kilobyte a month. Yeah. yeah. But when will you get a good, a good picture? <laughs> oh, well. Uh, Maybe I can get. Maybe it's not at one. In, maybe it's one. Maybe it's not one in a trillion. Uh, I suspect that. Uh, well, I'm sorry. There are different levels at which I could have discussed whether it's one in a trillion or one in a billion. Or, so some of the events get thrown out very early without even the computers looking at them. They get thrown out in hardware. So when I was quoting the one in a trillion, I already included that, which I think is already a factor of at least a thousand. All right. <laughs> Yeah. Suppose a, a but, new particle is yeah, found. Yeah, thanks for checking. <laughs> I should be careful. Right? Something yeah. new is found. Yes. What would it take to convince you that it wasn't a supersymmetric partner? Oh, well, once, once you find something that's not within the framework of the core theory of the standard model, then it's... Uh, the game is not over by any means. You have to figure out what it is. Right? These particles don't come with labels saying supersymmetric particle. Right. <laughs> so you have to investigate. You have to investigate things like what its mass is, what its spin is, what it decays into, and compare that with predictions from some theoretical framework. That so this kind of back and forth in the interpretation between you put up possible theoretical frameworks and compare to what's observed and work back and forth until they match in detail. It's sort of, it's a common uh, procedure in science, but perhaps familiar in chemistry where you want to figure out the uh, shape of some molecule and you have its uh, magnetic resonance image pattern or its spectrum or its x-ray diffraction pattern. So you make a model of what you think the molecule might look like Given that guess, you calculate the spectrum, the diffraction pattern, whatever you've measured, and then you go back and forth until they match. That's, so it'll be like that. The details are different, but the spirit is very similar to that. Yeah? What evidence do you have that if supersymmetry holds, that gravity will, will merge with the other three forces at the same time? Well, just this calculation. <laughs> just this calculation. So... Uh, so it's a very crude calculation. Also, all it tells you is that the sort of raw power of these interactions becomes equal. It doesn't tell you what the unified theory would look like. And that's sort of what string theory is all about, trying to guess what the unified theory would look like. Yeah. This is intentionally the goofiest question I could possibly think of. Oh, good. good. <laughs> if, if these investigations require such huge amounts of investment to, to look at a very narrow point um, in terms of energy and so on and so forth. Yeah. Why isn't it possible that the physics community is involved, at least in this experiment, in a completely self-fulfilling prof uh, prophecy? Because you're looking in this one corner for phenomena that might reinforce this. Had you gone in that direction, you might, at, these, at similar energies or different attacks, found phenomena that completely contradict what you're doing. In other words, you're building a funnel that's consistent with theory, and maybe it will or won't be consistent with theory, but that doesn't mean left field doesn't have a whole lot more stuff in it. You're absolutely right. What, yeah. what happens with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, people, people worry about exactly this phenomena. I mentioned in response to a previous question that some of the events don't even get to the level of being seen by a computer, let alone a human being. Uh, so a lot of thought has gone into designing what are called triggers so that at, at each level you have to throw away events and look at only ones that, that obey certain criteria. And if the triggers are badly designed, you can miss things. And all I can say is that we're aware of the problem <laughs> and people uh, propose all kinds of wacky ideas to, to suggest how you might want to relax the trigger sometimes. But there's a tension. You want to 
you want to test the ideas that are somehow most plausible and barely accessible uh, before you look at wackier ones. But if you know, if if the um, if phenomena show up that don't fit into any of the existing theoretical frameworks, we'll have to go back and revisit everything. And, and uh, yeah, then then all bets are off, right? <laughs> this place where if you put enough energy or focus into something, you're going to find lots of new things. Oh, so definitely. definitely. So and that, and that, that's, that's not a conjecture, or as if that's the, that's the truth. I mean, as I said, uh, the grid has it all. These fluctuations really are fluctuations of every conceivable existing thing. And what this machine is enabling you to do is just to see what's already there. Is the, the corollary to the question yes. is, so is you're, you're necessarily, because of the huge data rates, doing a tremendous pruning yes. of the data flows that comes in. Is anybody, in, in terms of the wacky ideas you discussed, is anybody saying, hey, let's, let's just move the criteria over here for a little while and collect some extra data? Yes. And, right, okay, so that's yes. going on. Oh, oh yes. Great. <laughs> <laughs> the collaborations involved in these experiments and their analysis involve th literally thousands of physicists and uh, different little subgroups go off in in different directions and they argue about okay let's change the trigger this way let's change the trigger that way and uh, if someone can make the case it gets done but you know there's a prioritization the most likely things get done first yeah so the follow-up to this what's the process in the uh, scientific community to decide what's going to build be built next after the the LHC because you know it's yeah. so much money it's so much yeah. yeah, forefront of technology. You can only build one thing at a time. Who's, what's decided what's the next thing that we build on that? Well, it's the usual thing. You form a committee. <laughs> there, there, are, there have been several committees you know, by uh, distinguished scientists, you know, sort of selected, roughly speaking, from the National Academy or something like that, uh, that then hold town hall meetings at leading universities and labs around the world to, to let everybody have their input. And uh, it, it's, it's also sort of like citing the Olympics. Different, a lot of different places want to have the laboratory, so they bid for it. So it's, a, it's I guess th maybe that's a good analogy. It's kind of the same process that goes into citing the Olympics, except... Uh, there's another layer, which is you have to determine which events are going to get included, and, and uh, so which exactly which machine is going to be built. That that's, that that's uh, there are different options that are discussed, and they they com and they compete too. So so it's it's a it's a well vicious is too strong, but it's a very competitive process. <laughs> yeah. So how, how reproducible are the experiments? Like, I, I was always wondering, are you always uh, worried that you're going to run an experiment, see something wonderful, and then never see it again because it was just luck of the draw? Or well, <laughs> uh, in principle, that could happen. Because uh, the nature of this experiment is really you do the same thing over and over again. That is, you collide protons. And all protons are the same. All protons are the same, <laughs> right? If if this were classical physics, and protons were point particles, neither what neither of which is true. But if if that were true, then then the same thing would always happen. But protons are complicated objects, and more important, uh, this is quantum mechanics. So really, what happens is you have probabilities of different things happening. And. Uh, now, the more events you study, the more the smaller probabilities you can explore. Now, in principle, say you might explore something whose probability, given your sample, was only one sixth to happen, and then then it would be very difficult to reproduce. You'd have to run for six times as long, or if you're unlucky, maybe twelve times as long. Uh, so that's the problem. So so. It's, uh, well, I mean, that's the nature of statistics. And the only way to solve it is to run for longer if you wanted the, the, to see rare... Yeah, 
One is from Belia, one is oh, yeah, no, uh, oh, absolutely. No, within, yeah, no, it, all these proposals for new physics come with calculations of how frequently they're going to happen. Uh, of course, as a function of the masses of the different particles and other things we don't know in detail, but roughly, uh, we have a rough idea of how frequently these are ha going to happen. And the LHC is really straining the frontiers of technology, both in terms of what the detectors can handle and in terms of what the computers to do the analysis can handle, precisely because we think the interesting physics is that rare that, that we need to have many, many, many collisions to uncover it. Yeah? The, the canceled uh, superconducting supercollider would yeah. have been even larger than the LHC. Right. I'm curious to get a comparison. LHC clearly takes us far beyond where we are today. Uh. How much beyond LHC would SESC have taken us? Uh, significant, but not enormously. Uh, it was uh, the L the SSC was uh, meant to be uh, about ten times higher total energy. Uh, on the other hand, the LHC uh, has higher luminosity, so more events at a slightly lower energy. So they're roughly comparable in so far as you can compare and, and how much new ground they'll break. But it's really a pity that uh, the United States missed out its chance for glory and, and the field got set back 10 or 15 years by the LHC cancellation. Yeah. Uh, so it's probably an extension of that question, but in the other side. <laughs> so <clears throat> what happens to the, uh, to the previous generation accelerators, for example, Teletron, is it going to be rendered useless or like what, what you physicists do with the uh, accelerators right. of the previous generations? Well, well different accelerators have had different fates. Uh, some of the old accelerators have been put to new uses. Uh, one thing that's been very important actually is what are called synchrotron light sources. So at earlier generations of accelerators, there was kind of this nuisance that the particles lost energy by radiating light. It's called synchrotron radiation at a synchrotron. Then people realize that this light is actually a very valuable resource, that it can be used to study uh, uh, molecular and biological processes in new ways that are very powerful. And so uh, now people not only use old accelerators to create that light, so what used to be the nuisance kind of parasitic effect is now the purpose of the thing. Uh, you don't look at the particles at all, just use the light. <laughs> or, and, and people have even, the demand is such that people have even built machines specifically to make the light. Uh, and there are synchrotron light sources uh, sprouting around the world. At Brookhaven, uh, there was originally a design to have a proton collider that was called Isabel. It was never actually fully funded or completed, but uh, that tunnel was then adapted, filled with different kinds of particles, and that became the relativistic heavy ion collider, RIC, which has been a very fruitful machine operating for the, next, the last few years. Uh, so the Tevatron I'm not sure <laughs> what, uh, the, the, I think the lab director is thinking very hard about what its possible uses are. Uh, it won't be the forefront of high energy proton collisions anymore, but it might be used as a source of neutrinos or for other kinds of experiments. So it's too expensive to use as a synchrotron light source, but maybe you can use it as a neutrino source instead. It would be a similar thing. These accelerators, they, they drop down as soon as LHC would be put in full power. So like, yeah, yeah, they can't compete with LHC directly as probes of the high energy frontier. So they'll have to be sort of find creative side uses somehow. Or just abandoned. They've Okay. <laughs> Who's been, had their hand up a while? I, okay. Uh, I just wrote this up there, so is there any chance of a practical application of the science found in the LHC? Well, there's always a chance. <laughs> <laughs> if there's something very surprising. <laughs> uh, 
the most plausible is that in some very small corner of theory space, there are ideas that maybe new kinds of stable particles would be found, charged particles. Then you could imagine having mu uh, using them to catalyze fusion. or so. Anyway, it, it's very far-fetched. Uh, but I was talking at lunchtime, actually, with a, a reporter from uh, MSNBC about this question, and it's been posed a lot. And I think it's, it's actually quite profound. When, when people ask about practical applications, what does that really mean? And I think it means that it's something that relates to, to uh, kind of basic, well, not using the, cert, the word in a pejorative sense, to primitive human drives. Like, if something helps to feed people, you don't have to ask what's the practical use of it because eating is a very basic human drive. Or if uh, something uh, helps people get shelter or avoid disease, you, you, know, you don't have to exp explain what it means to be practical because people like to be healthy and like to live a long time. Uh, or if something gives rich people prestige, you don't have to explain what's practical about that because people understand prestige is a very uh, prim basic drive. Uh, the drive that's being satisfied by something like this is a more evolved drive. That is curiosity, really sort of abstract curiosity. You want to understand the world at the most basic level. So it's, it's practical and, and well, it's not practical in that it doesn't obey, it doesn't satisfy the old drives, but it satisfies a new drive, which I think we can be pretty proud of, too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so thank you, and maybe... <laughs>